So I'm Daniel Ellenberg, and I am a, I'm a psychologist and a leadership coach and you know, a bunch of other things that I could say professionally. I'm, I'm a very good friend of Rick's. Rick and I have been friends for oh, over 35 years. And actually, he and I are going to be leading a workshop together uh, at the end of March, which is called The Courage to Connect. And part of what I actually do want to speak with you tonight about is the territory of connection. But first, I think that the most important part of connection is really how do we connect with ourselves, right? Because if we're disconnected from within ourselves, it's really hard to connect with other people because we're somehow, you know, we're fighting a battle, essentially. And I know quite a lot about fighting internal battles because I think I've spent much of my life uh, in self, self or self's conflict. I want to share about that because I've learned a few things over the years that I find are really helpful. So first of all, I want to talk about the territory of self-acceptance. Now, think about the word accept. Accept means to take as is, not as we wish it were, not as we fear it is, not anything else, but as much as possible, just the way things are, without adding a whole bunch to them which is no simple matter for us human beings. At the same time, I think that the, the theme or the concept of self-acceptance is limited. And I tend to look at it more as selves acceptance. And because I've always been pretty accepting of different parts of myself, you know, parts that I thought were loving and funny and cool and clever, smart, in ways like, yeah, I was very accepting of, of those particular parts of myself, but the parts that were mm, angry, you know, and impatient and scared and insecure and judgmental and harsh and cold. Seems like that list is a little bit longer uh, than the other one. And I think that in general, for most of us, from what I've seen and having worked with really thousands and thousands of people over the years, the negative parts tend to be stronger. Now we could say that that's related to, as Rick talks about quite a lot, negativity bias, and there probably is some truth to that. And it's also for sure related to how much negativity there is generally in the world. And we take in that negativity. If you think about a little child or a little a baby who's born tabula, tabula rasa without a lot going on, obviously the human scaffolding is there and it's available and will eventually develop over time. But a lot of how it develops is because of the messages we take in, we learn through modeling and imitation. I, I have a term, I call it psychoosmosis, and how we take in these messages through the permeable membranes of the brain. And once inside, they start coagulating, coordinating, and, and congeal into a characteristic, or we might call it an internal character. And there have been a lot of different systems. Someone's asking me before uh, we even did the meditation that, you know, what I was influenced in terms of different internal systems. I've been very influenced by Jungian psychology, psychosynthesis, some voice dialogue. You know, the newer iteration is around internal family systems. But all of these are recognizing that we're not just one self. Now, obviously, in Buddhism, you know, there's a whole different view of the self that there, that there is no self. And I think that there is certainly truth to that. And you know, at the same time, to really start to look at and to be accepting of, you know, the different parts of ourselves. Now, I have found <clears throat> that by looking at the parts versus from the parts is a huge path to freedom. Now, what do I mean by that? So I grew up with a major rager father. He was constantly angry. Really, underneath it all, he was a deeply wounded person. He grew up with a very abusive father uh, himself and 
He was, a, I think, a very sensitive being, and he didn't have resources to actually learn about himself, learn about his mind, develop a practice. He lived, he grew up on a farm. Someone mentioned a barn before. He grew up on a farm uh, in Connecticut, and you know, he too grew up, you know, milking cows. You know, and then he wound up leaving home at 16, and, and it's a much longer story, but he really, <laughs> Someone, um, okay, thank you. Uh, so he he developed just a huge temper and he took it out pretty much on everyone uh, in the family. And not surprisingly, I, through psychoosmosis, internalized a lot of that rage. And that rage coagulated inside of me and became part of uh, my characteristics, an internal character who was really, really angry. And I, shall we say, shared that anger with other people. And I wound up uh, feeling really ashamed, you know, because I would kind of lose it. I have bad temper and yell at people. I was harsh and cold and um, not kind, you know, to put it mildly. And that was, you know, a long time ago. And over the years, you know, I've, I've worked very hard you know, you know, around that because, you know, I, I guess to feel my emotions because at the same time, when I had all this anger in me, I also had deep sensitivity and probably there was a relationship between those two. And I would feel so ashamed when I would hurt someone, you know, through my anger. And over the years, I came to, to uh, really have such a very negative self-concept because, it, you know, I was acting uh, outside of you know, my deeper value system. Now, over the years, I, as I practiced more, I started to see something different about the anger, which is I started to st and stop calling myself an angry person, like that was my identity. And actually that there was anger, that there was a part of me you know, that was angry and could get angry. And so I really started to look at that part and to disidentify with that part. And so instead of saying, I am angry, or I am insecure, or I am judgmental, or I am impatient, I could start to look at those different parts of myself. And in looking at versus from, I actually started to feel more peace and a greater sense of freedom. Now, one of the challenges for us human beings is that we tend to believe what we think and tend to believe what we feel. And that's fine sometimes, but other times it's not fine because much of what we think and feel is really informed by factors that influence us that are kind of outside of our control and, and, and oftentimes outside of our core value system. And so we take those in and, and become a part of who we are. And unless we start to start stepping, step back from those and, and disidentify with them, they have a way of usurping our attention. And I, I oftentimes think about it in, like a thought in terms of like a free radical. So we have a thought like, you know, I am a shitty person, you know, or I don't know what I'm doing, or I can't do anything right. And what happens then? The thought comes up, and does the thought just exist as itself? Not most of the time. Most of the time what happens is the thought is a free radical. And what it does is it connects with a sensation in the body and or an emotion. So it may turn into something like, I, you know, I'm insecure. And then all of a sudden, ooh, you start to feel this sensation in your solar plexus or stomach. And then so, oh God, and it becomes more and more intense and it turns into a mood. And over time, when we practice, and it may seem like a strange way of talking about it, like this is a practice that we're actually practicing this over and over again, it gets reinforced and it becomes a habit, right? You think about practices lead to habits, like if you're doing it consciously, but they also lead to habits when we do it unconsciously. If you think about the word habit, it's the root of the word habitat. So it's actually mm -hmm. where we live. And so the degree to which we can start to notice those different habit patterns 
we can really begin to free ourselves. Now, I many years ago, I, I met someone actually in a group that Rick and I were involved with. I don't need to go into the whole story about it, but I remember he would kind of challenge me about some of my thinking, you know, which was there was a way that I took things very personally, a very deeply emotional person. And he kept introducing this idea to me that I've, I've internalized is something I've, I've come to really believe because it's been many years since these conversations began. And the, the way of looking at it is like to view oneself strangely as a system so that there's, there's something that's very personal on the one hand, it's like what you feel, you, it couldn't feel more personal. But at the same time, there's a system that happens. So each of us, are actually systems you know, within ourselves. And we have systems within systems within systems. So we have like our own individual system. And then we have the people who are closest to us in our lives that are part of our little larger system. And you keep making the, extending that further and further and further out until you include the whole planet and, you know, and beyond. And so to be able to look at oneself as like, oh, wow, isn't that interesting? You know, I got triggered. Like, so for me, for example, tonight, this isn't my uh, kind of easy sweet zone. I'm not used to being on Zoom with hundreds of people and, and talking. So it's not like something that I do all the time. I'm way more comfortable in general and familiar with, being with this, an individual or small groups or, you know, a little bit larger group or something that is just more in my comfort familiar zone. So what happens? I come into a situation that's less familiar. And what happens is something in my system starts sending out anxiety because it experiences as threat that something could go wrong. Now, the old me would have been like, oh, God, what is wrong with you? You've done so much work on yourself. You've done so much therapy. You know, you've meditated, like all these different things you've done. And yet still you feel anxious, like there's something wrong with you for feeling that. And but the more emerging part of me has been much more like, hey, you know, I'm a human being that there's some experience or something in the system, right? There's something in the Daniel Ellenberg system that's not personal, but actually feels threatened by the experience. And as I name that to myself and I breathe with it and I go like, okay, and I can have compassion, you know, for that part of myself that feels like a little wobbly you know, at times going into unfamiliar territory. Now, who doesn't feel anxiety, right? Anxiety is a major part of life. Without anxiety, you know, we wouldn't be alive. Uh, sometimes I wonder if some people have enough anxiety, like walking across the street, looking at their phone and not looking at the traffic. I mean, like, sometimes anxiety keeps us alive, you know, and so we have to pay attention to that and recognize that everything that we experience as human animals or human animals is just part of the system. So what do we do with all this? You know, because it's, it's really certainly challenging being human. I don't need to tell any of you that. You have your own difficulties. You have your own loves. You have your own losses. You have your own strengths. You have your own difficulties. Life itself is vulnerable. And we know that. We know that at some point, it's going to end. I mean, Buddhism is said to uh, exist between two different fundamental facts of life. One is that we're all going to die. And the second is we don't know when that's going to happen. And that ambiguity of wondering, you know, living, you know, as the existentialists say, on the razor's edge between being and non-being, you know, is, you know, certainly obviously vulnerable. So what do we do with this? You know, on some level, the first part of it is really accepting vulnerability and honoring yourself as a vulnerable being. That doesn't mean weak, being vulnerable. You know, it just means that you're kind of open to life. And how do you keep opening, you know, to these vulnerabilities? Because when, when I found that, as I do, as I open, you know, to the vulnerability, there's something beautiful that happens. There's an opening. But if I, if I tighten around it, it gets really contracted. One of, one of my favorite stories is the, is the story of the sun and the wind, which I'll share with you. It's an old Aesop's fable. 
So one day, <clears throat> the, the sun and the wind were having an argument. You know, who was stronger? And they decided on a contest. The contest was this. Who could get this, the coat off of this, this wanderer on this mountain trail below them or faster? And the sun said, okay, you can, you can have at it first to the wind. And so the wind stepped up and the wind started blowing and blowing and blowing and blowing and blowing. And the more the wind blew, the more the guy tightened his coat. The, so the wind blew and blew and blew and the guy tightened and tightened and tightened. And the more the wind blew, the more the guy tightened until finally the wind went out of air. At which point the sun said, step aside, maybe not step aside, but it came in and the, wind, and the sun started beaming light heat onto this guy. And the more that the sun being this, this heat onto the sky, he just started opening, opening his coat, and then sat under a tree. I think a lot of us treat ourselves more like the wind than the sun. You know, and part of why I keep emphasizing when there's a, a tight part, a part that feels vulnerable, to bring kindness to yourself, that's a way of, of the sun beaming light and beaming heat beaming love onto that part. Because the reality is when we criticize these parts, and I'm sure, you know, um, if not all of us, most of us wish that there's certain parts of us that weren't there, of course, and that's, that's human. But if we just reject those and get harsh on those, they actually tighten. And so as we open to them and we breathe, breathe kindness to them, that allows us to you know, expand ourselves. So one of, the, one of the big things is, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, is really you know, looking at versus from. Now, there, there was some research done at UCLA many years ago, but still when there were fMRIs, which are functional magnetic resonance imaging machines, which basically take videos of the brain. And they gave people this task, which was when to actually feel some level of threat. They, they gave some condition where people felt, you know, kind of a threat energy. And they had them do this one particular uh, practice, which is instead of just saying, like, I'm anxious or I'm an anxious person, they would say to themselves, I notice there's a part of me that feels anxious. Or I notice there's a part of me that feels angry. Or I notice there's a part of me that feels whatever it happens to feel. And what they found was that in these fMRIs that the brain patterns shifted from the amygdala area, which is the fight, flight, you know, triggering, emotional hijacking area, more into the prefrontal cortex, which tends to be a little calmer. And it would send GABA out, which is a calming uh, molecule. So it's just being able to kind of step back from that that can be super freeing. And indeed, that's a lot of what mindfulness you know, can be about. Like when I'm, when I'm sitting, you know, I'm oftentimes you know, having thoughts about different things that can pull you off in tension. And if I fight that, it keeps grabbing attention. And it's time to go, okay, you are welcome here. You too, you too are welcome you know, in this. And that's why the Rumi poem, I think, of the, of the guest house, you know, has been a very, popular poem over years because essentially it's saying like every, you don't know what's going to show up we are not in charge we're not in charge of our thoughts you know they thoughts happen you know like in, you know in buddhism is monkey mind and so when these thoughts come up and you don't like those you're trying to contract them they just get worse and so how do you keep, keep letting go letting go letting go um so I want to I want to open it up for thoughts, feelings, reflections. I know that you know, kind of like my prompt was to kind of read people's questions and things like that. I kind of prefer to hear people's voices. So what I'm going to ask is that those of you who have questions, reflections, to raise your your virtual hand and to really try and keep it. Uh, fairly brief, so not no, to, no long stories about yourself as interesting as they may be. All right, so Tony. Okay, 
Um, thank you for this session. It was very interesting. Um, I have a question with regard to our parts, our uh, personal characteristics, our qualities, etc. In terms of um, dissociating, and based on your experience, do you think that dissociation identity disorder could be viewed on a spectrum where you have everyday people that you're driving in your car and you go from A to B and you arrive and you say, how did I get here? Where you've dissociated, it's just a common occurrence to somebody with, you know, uh, dissociative identity order, the same way that we have autism on a spectrum. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of times when we look at like DSM 5 R you know, diagnostic statistical manual, it's kind of like, it, it almost like speaks about like these discrete categories. I don't see it that way. I'm, I tend to be more of a continuum person, you know, in the sense of like in the extreme, you have a dis dissociative disorder. Oftentimes when people have really intense sexual, you know, physical abuse. And of course, these different aspects split off and they become truly autonomous. But, but I also think at the same time, when we look at these different characters you know, within us, they're fairly autonomous also. And they're not necessarily in agreement with each other. And so the degree to which we can actually be aware of them, not judge them, be aware of them, and learn more about what their wants and needs are. Because you, know, you think about just in a, in a simple way, maybe not that simple, like the territory of dieting. I always think that it's, it's a bad word because when you think about the first three letters of the word diet, you know, like, why would anyone have resistance, you know, to, to die? Because there's some unconscious association of dying, you know, with, with that. And so the, the system feels deprived. And what does it do? It wants to, you know, eat something. So there's a conflict there with it, the part that wants to look healthy or feel healthy or you know, be healthy or more attractive, whatever it happens to be. Thank you. All right, Rick. Rick, I hope that's uh, that's a virtual background, I gather. I wish it weren't. Looks lovely. You're on mute, though. I'm trying to unmute. There we go. Uh, Dr. Ellenberg, thank you very much for your talk and for the meditation this evening. I wanted to ask you about um, my experience in the meditations this evening, I felt a, a deep um, stillness. Hmm. And, and I think that's probably probably a, a good good thing. Maybe that's, that's um, you know, it's worth enjoying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I'm wondering, I, I guess what would be really helpful to me is, and maybe you could provide some insight is, what is it, um, you know, what happens to, um, to prompt such an experience sometimes and then other times it's like nothing, you know, uh, any, any thoughts there? I mean, uh, you know. that's, a million, that's a million dollar question, isn't it? Because if you knew the answer, mm -hmm. uh, that question that you could create the, the conditions in which you always went there. Right. Yeah. But I think that to me, what I try to do is really let go of attachment to a great meditation, mm. you know, sure. a great experience. There's more, when you think about the irony of it, the more that you get attached to the experience, the more you're trying, you know, to have that experience, the more you're trying to have that experience, paradoxically, the less you have it. And so sometimes it comes as grace, you know, in a way. But then it's the next time. It's like, what's, what's next? I mean, if you try to recreate a one, well, we had this great experience going to this restaurant at this particular time. And if we go there again, we're going to, and then you go there again, and you don't have that experience. All right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, the other question I had, and I'll let, uh, let you get on to other, other uh, questioners. Lots of folks want to talk to you tonight. Um, Again, I want to. Re I really want to express my appreciation. Um, so, 
in the midst of experiencing this, I, I felt like I could stay in that place for a longer period, much longer period of time. And I'm wondering, am I, are you sort of indulging yourself when you do that? Or, or some part of me felt like this is kind of healing. Nice. And, you know, and okay. on a lot of different levels. I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm happy to hear that. That's touching you know, to me. And I, I wish that for you, you know, ongoingly. You know, and you know, maybe part of it was that you allowed more parts of yourself to be there. Mm. Yeah. Because when we deny those parts and try to kick them out, they mm. just have a way of tugging on us. And kind of like, it's mm. kind of like if you have a little kid and the kid wants something, you kind of go, come on, you know, get, get, get away, leave me, you know, leave me alone. What is it? Does it, you know, normally, you know, you keep pulling on you more, trying to get your yeah. attention. You know, and when you give attention, things let go. Thank you. I'll let you get okay. on to other other folks. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Gwen. Thank you very much for your insights. So a quick comment and a question. One of the things that I found valuable um, is the acronym WAIT. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard that, but it says for why am I talking? And um, the unfortunate thing is I forget it <laughs> more than I remember it. But a question about re- being in relationships, developing intimate relationships, where you often find yourself reacting from emotions, reacting from that inner child. Is it better, or from your perspective, is in the healing process better to stick with it and learn and grow or recognize I'm just continually doing the same thing over and over again and need to remove myself? Boy, we talk about age-old questions, huh? I mean, as someone who's done a lot of couples counseling, over the years, uh, as well as being in a long-term marriage. Um, there's no easy answer to that. I mean, if, if it's a clearly abusive situation, then, then it's an easy answer. But many situations in life are not quite that clear. And on one level, if, you, if you're not growing from the experience and you feel like there's not room for you to really, you know, to be yourselves, to bring out different aspects of yourself, I would look at it in terms of is this is this supporting is this serving my own kind of personal evolution and is it getting in the way of my making a bigger contribution being more connected to other people? You know, again, um, there's, these are difficult answers, right? Because you know, there's a part of you, I'm, I'm part of all of us, <clears throat> who wants you know deep connections, you know, with people, and then it's like. Is that person really able, available, open to receiving us in our, you know, beauty warts and all? And, and you know, I know for me, when I, I was engaged to another woman many years ago, and I asked myself a question that led me to leave the relationship. And the question I asked myself was, could I fully heal myself being in relationship with this woman. Not that she would be responsible for healing me, not that, but that was there some way that the way the dynamics were, it was counter to what I wanted to evolve in myself. My answer was it, it wasn't gonna work, so I left it. And I found someone who's actually better for me. And by the way, in terms of the acronym WAIT, I love that acronym. I, I actually, some of you may know Chris Germer, who's one of the founders of Mindful Self-Compassion. And I was leading a workshop with him, but it's like a workshop for men in self-compassion. And he shared that with me as some years ago. And I've, I've told many people about that. And, and I've had people say, well, what about waste? Uh, why am I still talking? You know, or, you know, or I have friends who say, wait, which is why am I not talking? <laughs> Basically, because it wasn't bringing things up. So I, I, I think it's a great acronym. So thank you. All right, Fran. So um, I have a question and it's about um, 
more of a situation if you are in a business meeting or uh, maybe you're with a relative who is very uh, rat-ta-tat-ta-tat and you have to give an answer right away. And the person that you're dealing with is not, uh, uh, it's not somebody who can, you can say, uh, I'd like to take a moment to gather myself. <laughs> I'm just wondering what your uh, way of either um, giving yourself that moment or asking the person to uh, give you that space. I spent a lot of time working for, for uh, very aggressive high technology companies where you had to give the answer immediately. If not before you opened your mouth, you had to come to the bottom line. And there wasn't this moment of grace where you could gather yourself. In fact, the perception, if you said, I need a moment of grace to gather myself, they would have said, what kind of a weak person is this who doesn't know the answer? Bing, bang, boom. So how do you function in these environments that many of us are functioning in, either in our work life or our private life, or even in a, a customer or vendor relationship? How do you carve yeah. out right. that moment? Well, first of all, I, it's a challenging situation, you know, because on some level, if you think about someone or someone who sort of basically like, give me the answer, come on. What's the answer? Like that, that kind of energy. There's something that's very threatening about that, right? I mean, it's not, it's not the kind of thing that is gonna make someone feel safe, right? And when you think about organizations, there's been a lot of research in organizations around what are the key factors in organizations. And it turns out that two, two areas stand out more than, other, more than any other areas. One is psychological safety, and the other is shared understanding. You're talking about the territory, at least of psychological safety, and you're not feeling safe then. Now, in an individual meeting like that, you know, the, the first thing I would want to do is practice self-compassion. You know, it's just like to be, okay, this is, this feels hard. And this, you know, this is, this is something that is, I'm feeling some level of threat and it's okay. And I can get through this. It's like your own kind of self-talk. But the other thing really has to do with asserting yourself and saying like, you know what? I would love to give you a good answer, but I'm not sure what it is right now. And rather than blow smoke up your whatever, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to sit with this and I'll get back to you about it and you can hold your boundary. And if someone says gets all tight about it, I, I tend to think about, you know what, I wouldn't want to work in a company that kind of supported that. And I know that there are a lot of companies that, that are really harsh like that, but I'm also seeing a real change in the organ, organizational atmosphere where people are kind of really beginning to recognize the need for psychological safety. And HR departments are, you know, just full of focusing on safety. But to give yourself room and, you know, you don't have to be related to everyone. All right, thank you. So Eileen. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm really grateful to be in your presence today. Um, I, I wrote my question down just to be succinct, um, so I'm just going to read it out here. Um, so my question is, uh, I'd like some suggestions on how to address uh, terror and the freeze response that occurs with certain authority figures, like a boss. Given that it's a, a complex trauma response, I do find it helpful to approach the frozen part of my system once I finally do deactivate with compassion, I don't, I don't find it that it stops the freezing response from occurring though. Um, so I do find compassion helps me feel better about the situation once I've come down from it, but um, I don't find it effective in helping me avoid it from occurring. So um, is there a more effective way to heal this? Uh, perhaps by either seeing a specialist 
um, that deals with complex trauma, or would you have any kind of suggestions from your expertise and that and knowledge base? Mm. Wow. Thank you. Oof. I'm I'm pretty confident I'm not the only person who's feeling you and into that's a that feels like a really big important question and I would definitely see a trauma specialist for sure you know there and if you look at the, the kind of the scaffolding of the brain those experiences uh, that were traumatic at whatever time in life they're wired in they're not hardwired they're soft wired because hardwiring is just kind of the basic kind of strings and machinery of the brain but they're going to be a part they're part of your brain now the good news is that you can build on top of that which is what you're doing you know right now the way you were talking about being compassionate to yourself you know in an instance like that but the the original trauma it doesn't go away but over time through practice and and i think through being a specialist you know could help you with it it will start to you know, loosen its tangles. I can tell you that for me as someone who experienced quite a lot of trauma uh, in my childhood, I developed in a way where I literally, I could not look people in the eyes. When I was 20, my, my first therapist thought I was gonna be institutionalized because I was in such a panic state. You know, but I've, over time of practice, that's changed, but is that part still in me? Yeah, absolutely. But I can look at that part, you know, versus from it, which I used to. I do hope you see a specialist. Thank you. Yin Ling. Hi. Hi, Daniel. Hi. Um, this is my first uh, time on this uh, uh, group. Wow. So thank you for being our my first speaker, because I, I just really appreciate you're sharing your vulnerability in growing up in a household where there was a lot of raging and anger because I grew up in a household like that. And I think about this when you talk about the systems within systems and, you know, think about the way economic violence and stressors for farmers and people who live on the edge and immigration or all those kinds of things. And um, but I wanted to hear more from you about what was your healing journey like and what you found most helpful in that you you spoke a little bit about it um uh but i would like to hear more <laughs> yeah well thank you um <clears throat> hmm. <sighs> i'm bringing back years i'm i think there were I had two very strong uh, dynamics. Uh, one of them was that I was uh, uh, terrified. And the other was that I had a deep, deep, deep desire to connect. And it was, it was that desire to connect that really motivated me. You know, so despite how scared I was, judgmental, self-judgmental and et cetera, there was, there was some part of me that just kept prodding me to risk, you know, and to risk risk being open in relationships, you know, and to literally, you know, bring up like, I would kind of like joke around, I, don't, I, I didn't do it exactly like this, but I think about a, a little kid who goes like, I like you, do, do you like me? Do you like me? I like you, do you like me? Like the innocence of that little kid who just who really wants to connect. I, I should feel a little teary right now. Thinking about that, um, and it was just—it was just really that vision, you know, of connecting. That, that I kept pushing through my doubts, and I just—I just—I I was, you know, um, I, on some level resilient about because I got knocked down many, 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 many times, but I just kept getting up. It's like the the. The old Japanese proverb, fall down seven times, stand up eight. You know, and so I kind of live by that. And I, I think I still do, you know, frankly, because there are times when, you know, I, I feel a relationship discord, you know, with people. I know with, with my wife, we wouldn't be together if we hadn't, you know, uh, talked about all the difficulties 
you know, that came up in our relationship early on and be willing to work on and work through those. But it does take a level of uh, willingness. So it's not comfortable. When I hear people say, you know, something like, are you willing to do, this? are you are you comfortable doing this? I think that's a terrible question. It's not comfortable, you know, but you have to be willing to deal with discomfort in the service of what you want to really create and bring forth. So thank you. All right, Rachel, we have like one or two more. Uh, yes, hi, thank you so much for this evening. I appreciate it. Uh, my question, you kept referring to parts and I was wondering if you can explain that and how you identify parts and, and give me more information regarding that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, look at, one way of looking at parts is looking at moods. You know, they have different moods, you know? And so I know for me as someone who has suffered from a lot of depression, you know, also, you know, that, that depressed part of me has a, has a particular constellation, just like it has for other, for everyone else, you know, or an angry part, you know, or a scared part. So think about kind of moods as an extension of emotions that in some level become like even larger than those. And that you start to go like, oh, you know, who are you? Like one way of, of working with that is when you start to feel something like, yeah, like an anxiety in your solar plexus, say, you can start to go like, you know, who are you? You can start to actually dialogue, you know, with that part. And that part might say something like, I'm scared. And you go, what are you scared of? I'm scared of people. <laughs> and you go, you're scared of people. Well, you know, what are you scared of? Well, I'm scared I'm going to be hurt. And then you can start kind of like dialoguing with that and start bringing it out. I guarantee you that if you start talking <clears throat> to these different parts and start inquiring, things will come up that you've never thought of before. So I tend to look at these, these the, like uh, a way of kind of dialogue and even turning a part that may be uh, seemingly antagonistic, you know, into a friend. And so it's like, you didn't do this right. It's like a self-critical part. And, and go like, wow, that you sound really harsh. I'm really sick of what you, you're not doing it. You say you're going to do this and you don't do it. And then you kind of turn it around and go like, okay, well, if you were me, what would you do? And it's amazing how much information that can come from this critic because this critic is actually, you could call it a traitor character, which is kind of a dysfunctional angel, you know, in the sense that it has a positive purpose. It just has a negative method. And so what would you do? And it may give you information. I, just, I would really recommend looking at internal family systems and psychosynthesis is way too much to kind of go into, but it's a great question. I'm gonna take one last question. And this is Evelyn, is that how you pronounce it? You got yeah. it. Yeah, Evelyn. Um, thank you so much for your talk and spending your evening with us. I'm so deeply moved by everything that you've shared. So thank you. Um, I feel like, especially being on the path, there's a strong desire to have this ideal of wanting to be more peaceful, for example. And I also completely understand that we have to look at the parts of ourselves that are difficult, like when anger arises or when shame arises. And I was wondering if you can give some suggestions on how to balance both wanting that, um, I guess, like positive improvement as well as totally accepting the difficult emotions. Because sometimes I think wanting to be peaceful and loving in very difficult situations all the time um, actually makes makes me kind of beat myself up yeah, uh, of course. when I fail to live up the, to those yeah. ideals. Right, of course, because it is an ideal and you know, life has a way of presenting reality and we have a way of thinking about ideals. You know? And so I would pay more attention to the, part, parts, the other parts that don't feel necessarily peaceful. 
you know, like there, there's a body of work called ironic processes. And the basic idea is this, there's a guy named Daniel Wagner, no longer with us, who did, I think, some brilliant research on how the mind works. And what he, what he spoke about is that in the mind, there's an operating system, like your IOS. And the operating system is trying to fulfill operations, right? And so when you say to yourself something like, uh, I don't want to feel conflict, or I don't want to feel anxious, or I don't want to feel, what happens is that's the operation. And so the mind is operating to try and not feel those things. At the same time, there's a monitoring system that's seen the degree, it's checking out monitoring, so to speak, the degree to which you're successful with the operation. And so what that translates into is like, I don't want to feel anxious. That's the operation. And the monitoring system is checking the degree to which you're not feeling anxious. And in doing so, ironically, it leads to feeling greater anxiety because that's what it's looking for. There's, it's like, don't think of pink elephants. Actually, this guy, he wrote a book called, I think, uh, Don't Think of white elephants or something, I'm forgetting that, it's white, white something. And so if you really sit with and accept that you feel anxious or that you feel angry or that you, and you don't fight it, you're actually gonna wind up feeling more peaceful, you know, in the process. All right, well, thank you everyone. I know we're a little bit past the time. I, I really, you know, I appreciate the time with you and I, uh, you know, so much stuff on this planet, so many difficulties, and I just, you know, I'm, I'm rooting for love. <laughs> I'm rooting for love. Right, thank you all. I hope you enjoyed that talk. I offer these every week, along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free.